Okay. How's that? Okay, for some of you who haven't been here for a while, of course, it's not your fault, especially you, Catherine. I'm sure you would have loved to have been back here, but uh, it's good to see you back. We've been going through the book of Romans, and the, uh, the last few chapters have been really, really exciting, as far as I'm concerned, is because I think in chapters 6, 7, and 8, uh, Paul really describes the mechanics of what it really means to be a Christian. You know, what we've really achieved uh, through Christ in, in these few chapters. Now, today we're looking at chapters, chapter 8, verses 1 to 11. And you'll notice that it starts off with a therefore. There is therefore now no condemnation. And I remember one uh, brother who used to be at this church a long time ago, he's used this old cliche, if there's a therefore... Anybody want to finish that? Yeah, you've got to go ask what it's there for. So, to, I think to get a glimpse of what it's there for, we have to go back in Romans chapter 7, and I'll start at verse 18. Okay? So, Paul writes from verse 18 in Romans chapter 7, he says, For I know that in me, that is, in my flesh, nothing good dwells, for to will is present with me, but how to perform what is good I do not find. For the good that I will to do, I do not do, but the evil I will not to do, that I practice. Now if I want, now if I do want, I will not, sorry, excuse me, the way Paul, Paul must have had a hard time writing this, I'm having a hard time reading it. Verse 20, now if I do what I will not to do, it is no longer I who do it, but sin that dwells in me. I find then a law that evil is present with me, the one who wills to do good. For I delight in the law of God according to the inward man, but I see another law in my members, warring against the law of my mind and bringing me into captivity to the law of sin, which is in my members. O wretched man that I am, who will deliver me from this body of death? I thank God through Jesus Christ our Lord. So then, with the mind I myself serve the law of God, but with the flesh the law of sin. That lays the ground for where we're going to take off today as we get into chapter 8. But what we see here is Paul describing that he confesses in himself that there is two natures. There is a spirit nature and there is a sin nature that wars within him. This is the Apostle Paul. You know, we look at him. Oh, you know, he's a great man of God, you know, a great Christian. But even he confesses that he himself acknowledges that within him there is a war. Sometimes the spirit wins. His mind in the spirit is in the spirit. This new creation that has been given to him by the Lord Jesus Christ. It tells him what he should do to follow the righteous requirement of God, to follow his righteous character. But yet he is still living in a fleshly tent that demands that he do things that come naturally. Okay? And I'm sure if you're honest with yourself, you'll find that you find yourself in this struggle all the time. I know I do. Okay? Now there's another old cliched story uh, that can describe this, you know, and the, the, the desire is which one's going to win. And the, the, the story that's used, and someone reminded me of it a few weeks ago, was if you have two dogs, right? And one's a good dog and the other one's a bad dog. And the dogs are constantly fighting against one another. And the question is, well, which one is going to win? Well, the one that wins is the one that you feed, Right? Because it will become stronger and overpower the other one. Now, I think there's some issues we really have to understand is that ourselves in the flesh, the flesh nature, and we'll look at this today, is in itself powerless to overcome sin. The power to overcome sin does not reside in our flesh. It resides in the spirit nature that is in us if we are Christians. Okay? Now, let's read uh, today's passage. Now that we've seen what the therefore is therefore. 
says, There is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus, who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. For the law of the Spirit is life in Christ Jesus, has made me free from the law of sin and death. For what the law could not do, in that it was weak through the flesh, God did by sending His own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh on account of sin. He condemned sin in the flesh, that the righteous requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. For those who live according to the flesh set their minds on the things of the flesh, but those who live according to the Spirit, the things of the Spirit. For to be carnally minded is death, but to be spiritually minded is life and peace. Because the carnal mind is enmity against God, for it is not subject to the law of God, nor can indeed can be, so then those who are in the flesh cannot please God. But you are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit, if indeed the Spirit of God dwells in you. Now if anyone does not have the Spirit of Christ, he is not his. And if Christ is in you, the body is dead because of sin, but the Spirit is life because of righteousness. But if the Spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, he who raised Christ from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through his Spirit who dwells in you. Okay? Paul is excited. He's exuberant. He is thankful to know that although he sees this war within his members, he knows and has confidence that he will not face condemnation because he has the life of Christ in him. And I think we have to illuminate for ourselves what this means. If we go to Ephesians in chapter 1, we see this list of uh, points that Paul writes to the church at Ephesus. And he says some very comforting things. You are accepted. You are beloved. You are in the heavenly places. And there's more things that Paul says there. These are the things that we have as Christians. Well, day to day we don't see it. But the Bible tells us that is what we have. In, in essence, that is where we are. We are spiritual beings. Okay? We're still locked in this fleshly, earthly tent. The day will come when we will be fully delivered. But until then, we are in a spiritual battle. Okay? Now, that is who we are and where we are. And the thing I want to emphasize to you who are here today and those who are listening on the internet, that the issue that Paul is talking about here is an issue of sanctification. Okay? Paul has already laid the groundwork that our justification has been made by faith in Christ's work on the cross. You know, we, we celebrate at the Lord's Supper the death of Jesus Christ on the cross and his resurrection and the fact that we, through that, have been saved from the guilt of sin. And that's a great and wonderful thing. But you know, that's just getting in the door. right? Once we're into the door there is another huge realm of work that Jesus Christ has accomplished for us as Christians. And this is what Paul is talking about here. This is a sanctification issue. When it comes to the conflict between our sin nature, our flesh nature, as Paul says here, and walking in the Spirit, this is the issue of sanctification. And who helps us win this battle? Actually, who does win this battle for us? It's the Lord. It's the fact that Jesus Christ is in us and lives in us. That is where the power to overcome comes from. It's not our own flesh. Okay? Now, it says there's no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. What does this mean? What does this mean? We saw in chapters 6 that we are to account it to be true. Okay? Some translations is an accounting term. Reckon it to be true. That for those who believe in what Christ has done for them, you have died in the likeness of his death. And even as he has died to sin, 
lives to sin no longer. That is the same with you. And he rose again, being separated from the power of sin. And we identify ourselves as being raised with Christ too. And so we are in the same position. Okay? And we have a new life that's in us. Paul tells us, just account this to be true. Accept it. It's true. Believe it. And there we have a new being within us. And as that is where we are, we have taken on the identity of Christ. And actually, it's not we take on the identity of Christ. It's Christ comes and lives in us. And because Christ does not sin, and Christ is holy and righteous, there is no condemnation against that, is there? And that is where we are to abide. Okay? Now, so we have died to sin. We are free from its power. The day will come when we are changed and we are with the Lord forever. We will be delivered from the presence of sin forever. Now, that's something we still have to look forward to. But the fact is that we are not delivered from the presence of sin is why we're having this war. Okay? It's still in our, in our fleshly tent. The other thing that Paul says here is that we are free. He says, the spirit of life in Jesus Christ has made me free from the law of sin and death. Now, we acknowledge that sin is still affecting us, but we have to make the point here that we are free from it if we choose to be so. We'll get into the discussion later as we look at verses 5 to 8 where Paul mentions that those who are simply flesh only, who live in the flesh alone, that do not have the regenerative spirit in them, they are bound to sin. They can't serve God. It's impossible for them because their taskmaster is is sin, and sin will not let them serve another. Now, we are free. Why? Romans chapter 7 describes this. Paul uses the analogy of a woman who is married to a very controlling husband. But the woman was freed from that controlling husband when he died and was separated from her, and she is free to marry another. Paul uses this uh, series of, of a story not to write a doctrine about divorce and remarriage or death and remarriage, which sometimes happens, but he's drawing a picture of uh, the legal custom at the time in, in their heritage to show a truth that if you are married and you uh, take yourself to another person, you're breaking the law. You can't do that. And so what the, the picture is, is that if you are bound to the law of sin, you're bound to the law of sin and you cannot escape it unless there is a death that annuls that that uh, bond-servant relationship. And by identifying with Jesus Christ in his death and resurrection, God has made that separation possible. So our old master was sin. We're bound to him. But Jesus Christ says, no, you died to sin. You're free to serve a new master, Jesus Christ. Okay? So we are freed from the old master through Christ's death and resurrection on the cross. Now, we talk about the law. Is the law evil? We talked about this uh, a few weeks ago. We, we looked at this idea that, you know, you sort of steer yourself wherever you're looking. And we use this analogy of the, we had this idea in your mind of, a, of an elephant in a tree. Okay, sounds silly, Craig, I know, but. The idea was, and I'll just repeat it briefly for you, you, you picture an elephant in the tree, okay? And you can see him, maybe he's hanging from his trunk or something like that. And then I try to tell you, stop thinking about that elephant. Get it out of your mind now. Get it out of your mind, and you'll find that you can. And unfortunately, this is what the law did. The law was laid down by the Lord to take his covenant people and preserve them through a time until the promised deliverer would come. But the law pointed to sin. It pointed to what it was. And unfortunately, it did not have the power to make man stop sinning. It would simply point to them and condemn them and say, look, 
this is wrong, don't do it. You know, if you remember a couple of weeks ago, Don Axford used an analogy of where sometimes when you put up a prohibitive law, it has the opposite effect on people. If you remember, he had a picture of this hotel that was out on a weir out over the Gulf of Mexico. And there was an accident one day because someone decided to try fishing off one of the balconies. So they put up a sign, no fishing from balconies. And then even more people fished from the balconies. You know, what I remember, uh, they've taken them down now, but there was two of these signs on, on Ontario roads. One of them was at Gravenhurst. If you're heading down towards Toronto, there's this big sharp turn. And there's another one that used to be at in Burlington before you go over the Skyway into Hamilton. And they had these signs that if you're approaching too fast, it would start to flash. Too fast, too fast. Now, did that slow people down? Not at all. People sped up to make the sign go off, right? <laughs> and unfortunately, the law in some, sometimes had this effect. The, the law pointed out sin, but it magnified sin. It made it even more uh, deathly, if you could put it that way. I think that's the way Paul tries to describe it. But it failed. It was weak. It could not make mankind have power over sin. It just simply pointed to it. Okay? But when Jesus came, when God gave the world his son, through Jesus Christ, we see that sin was condemned. Okay? Because Christ fulfilled the law. Okay? It says, what the law could not do, because it was weak through flesh, right? The flesh nature of mankind. It, it did not... Uh, make mankind righteous through the law. God did by sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh. On account of sin, he condemned sin in the flesh. Now, <clears throat> how does Jesus fulfill the law? How does Jesus fulfill the law? First of all, I just want to go back into a little bit of, of uh, background that Paul even talked about in earlier passages. Let's just put the law back into context where, where it sits. If you remember, Paul made the argument that we are saved by faith apart from the law. We are saved by faith apart from works. And we looked at the, the fact in, in chronology that Abraham was deemed righteous by his faith long before works came along, which was circumcision, and long before the law came. It wasn't until Moses showed up that the law came into power. Okay? So we see that the law, the Mosaic law, had a purpose to magnify what sin was and to show his covenant people that this was the righteous requirement of God and it was to preserve them until the coming Messiah. Now, how does Christ fulfill this? First of all, we can see that Christ himself was made under the law. Okay? And as there was this promise made to Abraham that through his seed, that great blessing would come to his people and to all the world. Right? That was a promise made to Abraham way before the law. And we read about that in Galatians 4. Now I say... As long as the heir is a child, he does not differ at all from the slave, although he is owner over everything. But he is under guardians and managers until the date set by his father. This is Paul describing the law. Also, we, while we were children, were held in bondage under the elemental things of the world. But when the fullness of the time came, God sent forth his son, born of a woman, born under the law, so that he might redeem those who were under the law, that we might receive the adoption as sons. Because you are sons, God has sent forth the spirit of his son into your hearts, crying, Abba, Father, therefore you are no longer a slave, but a son, and then if a son, then an heir through God. So we see that Jesus fulfilled the law, and even before that, he, he touches into this promise that God made to Abraham. Okay, what else do we see about Christ fulfilling the law? He lived a perfect life of obedience to the law. Matthew 17, 5 says, While he was still speaking, a bright cloud overshadowed them, and behold, a voice out of the cloud said, 
This is my beloved Son, with whom I am well pleased. Listen to Him. There's no sin in Him. Also in 2 Peter, For you have been called for this purpose, since Christ also suffered for you, leaving you an example for Him to follow in His steps, who committed no sin, nor was any deceit found in His mouth. And while being reviled, He did not revile in return. While suffering, He uttered no threats, but kept entrusting Himself to Him, who judges righteously, and he himself bore our sins in his body on the cross so that we might die to sin and live to righteousness, for by his wounds we are healed. Our time's going out, but we see that Jesus illuminated the law. He understood the law. He taught the law. When the rich uh, lawyer came to him and asked, asked him about the law, Jesus explained it very well. The other one that I, I always liked was when Jesus was on the mount teaching to the masses. And, and there he was illuminating the law to the nation of Israel. These are the Beatitudes. You know, when Jesus describes, you say you don't commit adultery, but in your mind, what's going on? Maybe you haven't done the act, but the fact that the, the idea is in your mind, it shows you that you are a sinner and fall short of God's righteous character. He confirmed the promises made under the Mosaic Covenant. We can read that in Romans 15, 8 to 9. We're running out of time. In Hebrews 9, it tells us that Jesus Christ fulfilled the Old Testament patterns and types that we see in the Levitical law. Galatians 3, 13. He bore vicariously the curse of the law for us. And he made a new covenant by his blood, as we read in Romans 5 and 12. Therefore, having been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom also we have obtained our introduction by faith into his grace in which we stand, and we exult in hope the glory of God. Jesus fulfilled the law in many ways. And I can summarize it in these two points. One is we look, we do this every Sunday morning, we look back to that point when we see Jesus on the cross. And there we see the Lord taking all the sins of the world and placing it on Him. And He bearing the curse of the law for us. But He fulfilled the law because He was sinless the sin had no dominion on him at all and he was raised again. But you know, it's not only in his death that we look to see how he condemned flesh, or sorry, condemned sin in the flesh. And in that picture, we often look at the crucifixion in a sense as a, if, the, if sin is on Christ and we see Christ being crucified, we often think of it as sin being executed there. Okay? You follow that? That's one way of looking at it. The other point that we must look at is not only in his death did Jesus Christ condemn sin, but in his life as well. We think how he lived. Okay? Was Christ a sinner? Absolutely not. Okay? We look at his nature. When he was in the wilderness for 40 days, he was thirsty, he was hungry, and I think I, we can honestly say he was uncomfortable. Okay? And then Satan comes along to tempt him. Okay? Being tempted is not sinful. Giving in to temptation is the problem. But do we see Jesus faltering? No. Another example is when we see Jesus hours before his, his arrest and crucifixion. What is his attitude? You know, this is the son of the most high God. He's got Roman soldiers closing in on him. Could he obliterate them and knock them back? Absolutely. He's being reviled. 
Can he revile in return? Absolutely, he has the power to. But did he? No. His attitude was not to self-assert his will. It was not to make himself a great name for his own benefit, but it was to do the will of the Father. And that takes a unique attitude, doesn't it? He submitted to the Lord in everything. To his desire for righteous character, even to the point of his own death. Sin had no dominion over Christ. And because of that, Jesus did not give in to sin's temptation. And in doing that, he condemns sin. Because he demonstrates that sin is ineffective. It isn't necessary. I've rendered it powerless, is what Jesus has done in his life. And then he takes our sin and goes to the cross, and there God executes it for the believer. Okay? So what the law was weak and could not do through the weakness of flesh, God did by sending his Son that sin might be condemned in the likeness of his flesh. Okay? This is what the Lord has done for us. Okay? It says that the law can now be fulfilled in us. And how is that done? It's done in the spirit that lives within us. It is not through the power of our flesh. And here is where I think this is, this is really neat. And I think this is where we have to go back to Romans chapter 6 and take those words that Paul says very, very seriously. Account this to be true. Reckon this to be true, that you have died in the likeness of Christ's death and you have been raised in the likeness of his resurrection. And there, when you walk in the Spirit, when you, in a sense, let God be in control in your life, in those moments, sin has no power over you. Right? Because it can't. If your modus operandi, if I can use that word, is the spirit, you cannot sin. The problem that we face is moment by moment, we're not always there, are we? We're not always there. This is what Jesus was talking about in John 15. Abide in me. When you abide in me, okay, you will produce fruit of the Spirit. But if I do, you do not abide in me, you can do nothing. Absolutely nothing. Okay? Now, how is the law fulfilled in us? This is a neat way of looking at this. The law and the Ten Commandments in the old law says, Thou shalt not commit adultery. Thou shalt not dishonor your parents. Thou shalt not steal. Right? They're warnings. They're condemnations. And that's in the flesh. But think of it this way. In the Spirit, those commandments, those warnings become promises. Okay? If you are walking in the Spirit, you shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall not disobey dishonor your mother and your father. You shall ha not have gods before thee. Isn't that amazing? That's what happens in the Spirit. And so this is the, the battle that we have to face as Christians. Where are we leaning? Where are we looking? The latter part of Romans chapter 6, Paul encourages the believers, do not let your members be used as instruments of unrighteousness but rather be instruments of righteousness. No longer serve the old master, but serve the new. Okay? Now, this nature of the flesh, the Greek word is sarx, and it is our natural being. You know, I often think of, of you know, what, what would have Christ been going through on those last days before his crucifixion? You know, he was truly human at the same time, but his father was God, not Adam. But you know, there's so many things that go on in our body, especially if we're faced with the same sort of situation that Christ was. 
Just imagine what's going through your own flesh. Right? I don't want to have nails driven through my hands. I don't want to be whipped and scourged. I don't want to have everybody despising me and hating me. Those are awful feelings. Those are awful feelings. But in the flesh, they have a lot of power on us. Satan uses those weaknesses in our flesh to control us and to manipulate us. How do we overcome those things? Well, easier said than done, isn't it? We look to the Lord. We pray to Him. You know, it's, it's just not a poetic cliche in the epistles where Paul and others constantly encourage the believer to look unto Jesus. Set your mind on heavenly things. You know, set your mind on the prize that is before you. Because where you're looking is where you're going to go. If you focus on your worldly circumstances, that's what's going to drag you. That's where it's going to drag you. If you look unto to the Lord, then you can abide in the Spirit and you yield your flesh and He comes in and takes over and moves you along in your Christian life. Okay? That's feeding the one dog. Okay? That's feeding the, uh, the spiritual dog, if we can use that uh, analogy. Okay? So, if you only have flesh, if you're not regenerated, there's nothing you can do to appease God. Okay? And unfortunately, your, your end is eternal death. But that's for the unregenerated person. But for us who are saved, we see these two natures. Now, how do we look at it? Okay? The Bible says that I've trusted, if I've trusted in what God has done for me on the cross, I have been justified by faith. I have made righteous. Thank you, Lord. That issue's dealt with. Now, how do I become a more Christian person? Well, it's by letting the flesh be knocked down so that more of the Spirit in me can shine through. That's the process of being sanctified. You know, sanctification is a neat word. It really means being used for your design purpose. And one analogy I saw was beautiful. If I can take this pen and I write with it, well, it's sanctified. I'm writing with it. That's what it was designed for. But if I use it to stir my coffee, right... It might make the coffee bad because the ink might explode, right? And things are really messy, right? Okay, not sanctified. Okay, so the Lord is trying to take us who are created to be spiritual beings to reflect or to exhibit the righteous character of God. That is what we are meant to do. And the whole process of sanctification is day by day, the Lord is changing us and conforming us to do our designed purpose. Okay? The flesh is the opposite. The flesh makes us do what we were not designed to do. Okay, so we're being, we're stirring coffee instead of writing. Okay? Now, again, it comes back to the two dogs. Which one do you feed? Where do you look? Where do you direct your mind? That's, how I think, how we have to fight this battle. Now, let's think of an application here as, as we close. Okay? We all have natural responses. Okay? It could be wrath, resentment. You know, what do you initially feel when you, you're driving down the road and some jerk cuts you off? Right? What's your reaction? Right? Your heart starts pumping and you grip the wheel and... Right? That's what happens, right? Is that the spirit? What is that? That's the flesh, right? It happens. Okay? And time. It takes lots of time to overcome those things. You know, through circumstances and circumstances, the Lord will I, I trust will, will change you on those things. But what about some of the other ones that are a little bit more subtle? These are the ones that creep in slowly and kind of linger around like a bad smell. These are your fantasies. Okay? Perhaps you're fantasizing about um, getting revenge on somebody. You know, someone's hurt you in the past and you think about you know, how can I get them back? How can I show them you know, maybe that's one of your fantasies. Perhaps it's coveting. You know, <laughs> one Ten Commandments says that thou shalt not covet. And the hope of the Spirit is thou shalt not covet. But we find ourselves coveting. You know, maybe if I 
won that lottery, I can get that house or that boat or whatever. And lust, of course. Especially for the guys, that's a bad one. Okay? How do you deal with these things? How do you deal with them? How do you deal with them? Easier said than done, isn't it? It takes a choice. Every moment, every step. Where are you looking? Where is your mind? It goes back to what Paul said. You have the old master and you have a new master. The old master's dead. You're not bound to it anymore. You don't have to. If there's any obligation, it's to the new Lord, to the new Lord, the new master, because he has redeemed you. So what do you do? You know, oftentimes you find yourself, I know I shouldn't be doing this, Lord, but I'm having a little bit of pleasure right now in this, so I'll catch up with you later. Do you do that? What should we do? What should we do when we are faced with temptation? What did Christ do? When Satan said, I'm going to give you all these kingdoms, Jesus, he just goes right to the Word of God. Right away. He doesn't ponder Satan's temptation. He just knows right away. No. The Lord says this. Again, easier said than done. Heavenly Father, we, we, we thank you this morning for your faithfulness to us. Lord, if we have put our trust in Jesus Christ and his work on the cross, Father, your word tells us that we are saved, that we are deemed righteous, that we are in the heavenly places, that we are accepted, that we are beloved. And Lord, we give you thanks for that. And Father, your word also tells us that you are able to make what you have committed us to be. And we trust in you for this, Lord, until that day of redemption. And even here, Lord, as, as much as our justification was by your works, Lord, so is our sanctification. You are the one who changes us and transforms us. Father, the only thing we need to do is to yield out of the way. Father, today, I think our prayer is this, Lord, is that when we are in this battle between the old master and the new, Father, Help us moment by moment to take our allegiance immediately and consistently to the Lord, the Lord Jesus Christ, Father. May we abide in the Spirit. Father, help us to walk in the Spirit. Help us to have our minds on things above and not things below. Lord, we are, we are confident that you are faithful in doing this in us, Lord. And for this, we give you thanks. In Jesus' name, amen.